Hey everybody, this is kind of a shorty episode. Uh, what you're about to hear is the audio of the Sunstone presentation that Cody and I gave on the Smith and Theogen Theory. Of course, there is a video to accompany this, and if you want to really get a sense for what we're presenting, I really recommend you watch the video. You know, it's just right around an hour mark. It's not too long, and the video really adds to the presentation. But for those who don't want to watch the video, this is the audio from that presentation, and um, you know, hopefully, we can uh, kind of start a conversation with this audio. This is kind of a stripped-down version of the Smith Entheogen episodes that Cody and I did, because of course it was just a one-hour presentation, whereas that was like three hours of podcasting. Uh, but but there are obviously some interesting uh, developments in this presentation that were you know far and away beyond what happened in just the uh, the audio of Cody and I reading through the paper. So I'd recommend checking the show notes and going to the YouTube link. Uh, pause this, go watch the video if you have the time to devote to it. Otherwise, uh, without further ado, please enjoy the audio from the Sunstone Smith Entheogen presentation of Salt Lake City 2017. Thank you for attending session 323 titled Revelation Through Hallucination. Please silence your cell phones. As you listen today, we invite you to explore what it means to be Mormon. Who gets to carry that label? What does the history say? What does the theology say? At this conference, we encourage you to explore what it means to be Mormon. We don't like labels because the reality is there are as many labels as there are people, which is why you'll see that in your name badge sleeve, we have allowed you to label yourself the kind of Mormon you are or want to be. If you haven't yet, you're welcome to grab a Sharpie at the front desk to help disrupt the narrative of the one true Mormon and instead tell us who you are. This session is being recorded, and you will be able to purchase it after the presentation ends at the registration desk on the main floor. Take advantage, take advantage of our symposium special by subscribing to Sunstone Magazine, seven, seven issues for the price of six at the registration desk as well. Consider also purchasing School Candy official headphones customized just for Sunstone. I haven't even gotten to the hard part yet, and I'm already struggling. Your support goes directly to keeping symposiums and 40 years of thoughtful dialogue alive and sustainable. Don't forget to check out the bookstore in the ballroom hosted by Benchmark Books, and consider purchasing a book or two to support Mormon studies and scholars. This session is 60 minutes long, and we ask both audience and presenters to keep within the framework of that time, so we can allow for the next session to start on time. And as a courtesy to other presenters and our attendees, we ask that immediately after the session you clear the room and speak outside so other pr presentations can begin preparation for the next session. Um, and we will have a little bit of time for questions at the end. So if you'll save your questions um, until the end as a courtesy, that would be awesome, too. A little about this session. Given the unique psychoactive effects and, and abundant availability of myriad ethics, Ethiogens, you guys tell me when I say something wrong. There, exists, there exists evidence that Joseph Smith used plant medicines to incite visions and personal revelations for himself and his parishioners. This model provides a much needed naturalistic explanation for multiple instances of visionary experiences in Mormon history, which have been previously been, which have previously been explained with group hallucination psychology or attributed to the power of God. Cody Nakoni is a certified per permacultural designer specializing in mycoremediation and plant medicines. He's the researcher, host, and producer of the Silly Rabbits with a P, PS podcast, which investigates the history of eth ethiogen use. Am I saying that right? And the current medical science surrounding the field. Bryce Blankenagel is a full time researcher, host, and producer of the Naked Mormonism podcast. In its first year of production, Naked, Naked Mormonism won three Brody Awards. And we'll now turn the time over to them for this session. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out to Sunstone. Uh, this is the revelation through hallucination, as she said. I'm Cody Nakoni, host of the Silly Rabbits podcast, and that's my research partner, Bryce Blankenagel, host of the Naked Mormonism podcast. Hopefully some or all of you have a copy of our booklet, which is out on the chairs. And if you flip to the last page, you'll notice a notes and questions page with empty lines so you 
don't forget to ask any questions and um, we can, when we get to the Q&A session. To give you a brief rundown, I'll begin presenting the history with the science and history of entheogens, as well as defining the word. Then we'll take a little break and play a game uh, before Bryce comes up and presents the evidence for Joseph Smith's use of entheogens. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy. With the modern accessibility of pharmaceutical-grade medicines, it is easy to forget that the vast majority of these brightly colored syrups and perfectly uniform pills are more often than not derived from natural plant-based sources. Aspirin was considered a wonder drug and mod marvel of modern medicine at the time it was first introduced, and is still regularly used by most Americans roughly a century and a half after its invention. Aspirin is derived from common willow bark, and by simply chewing strips of the bark or making a tea with said bark, one can easily produce the same effects as its pharmaceutical counterpart. Evidence for the use of willow bark medicinally reaches back to the time of the Neanderthal and our early sapien ancestors. Similarly, caffeine is derived from coffee, nicotine from tobacco, or ephedra and its pseudosynthetic constituents, which can be found in most common cough syrups. The advent of the pharmaceutical industry was simply an attempt to make these already known and used plant medicines more reliably produced, easily transportable, and to ensure the availability with long shelf lives. Needless to say, our ancestors, before the advent of pharmaceuticals, most especially the poorer sort, had to avail themselves of herbcraft and plant medicines on a regular basis in order to even survive. Similarly, one had to be familiar with poisonous and intoxicating implants while, in order to avoid illness and death while seeking medical care. This is where our work on the Joseph Smith entheogen theory comes into play, which will focus on psychoactive plants and fungi which elicit altered states of consciousness. These plants and fungi, as you will see, were not only commonly used contemporary to the time of Joe Smith and the early saints, but may have been socially accepted among the religious and spiritually inclined. Altered states of consciousness are extremely hard to define. In the field of psychiatry, virtually any state of consciousness other than a normal, calm, and attentive state is considered pathology, something that must be analyzed and mediated in order to bring an individual back to that normal state. For the sake of time and scope, this presentation will be focusing on altered states of consciousness that are, fo that are, associated, <sighs> that are associated with uh, the spiritual or mystical experience. The pursuit of altered states of consciousness, which leads to moments of theophany, or a direct communication with a perceived deity, may be one of man's greatest and oldest pursuits in life, achieving the pinnacle of spiritual enlightenment by any and every naturally available method. These methods of achieving an altered state of consciousness may include, but are not limited to, physical exertion to the point of exhaustion, hatha yoga or holotropic breathwork, ecstatic dance, chanting or listening to music, religious ritualism, intimacy, or by a group of substances becoming commonly referred to as entheogens. <sighs> My apologies. Um, while all of these methods of achieving altered states of consciousness are certainly valid, especially on a person-to-person -person basis, entheogens are significantly more effective and reliable than these other methods and exhibit easily demonstrable chemical explanations for their effectiveness. This is most starkly observed in group settings where shared visionary experiences are incredibly difficult to elicit endogenously or without the aid of a chemical substance. Imagine, if you can, for a moment, a chemical substance which could part the veil, as it were, or throw one into an altered state which allowed one to momentarily glimpse into the mystical and divine. In 1909, William James penned the following, quote, Our normal waking consciousness is but one form of consciousness, which, all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie other types of consciousness that are entirely different. We may pass through our entire lives without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus, and at a touch, they are there in their completeness. Entheogens are a family of chemicals, typically of plant or mycological origin, which can be administered to reliably produce a non-ordinary state of consciousness for the purpose of initiating a mystical or religious experience. While they are not essential to the mystical experience, entheogens are most often used as a primary vehicle for or supplemental aid to reaching a state of religious ecstasy or theophany. Some entheogenic materials can and have in the past been used recreationally. Therefore, in order to properly delineate an entheogen from a so-called drug, proper dosage, set, and setting are critical factors to consider. 
Set referring to the psychological state of an individual's mind or the intention behind the ingestion of a substance. Dose is pretty self-explanatory. And the setting referring to the environment in which an individual administers that substance. A unified synergy of appropriately administered dose, set, and setting is what creates the statistical reliability we are discussing. The concept of a chemical which could elicit communication with deities or other worldly beings may sound like hyperbole from a burnout hippie smelling of patchouli, but there is a shocking amount of evidence to suggest, uh, to back up the idea that uh, entheogens can uh, do this. As demonstrated by the Harvard Divinity School graduate Walter Pank in 1962's Good Friday Experiment, otherwise known as the Miracle at Marsh Chapel, even a single dose administered under religiously compliant set and setting can prove to be one of the most powerful and meaningful religious experiences of an individual's life. During the double-blind study, 10 Harvard theology students were administered synthetic psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic psilocybin mushrooms, and another 10 students were given moderate doses of niacin, which would mimic the onset symptoms of psilocybin. The experiment took place inside Marsh Chapel after uh, inspirational sermons and several hymns were sung. Very quickly, observers noticed that the double-blind study was almost com- the double-blind study was almost completely useless, as it cl- was clearly apparent which participants had received the psilocybin <laughs> and those who had not. <laughs> those who had received the dose of niacin were then allowed to go home. <laughs> The graduate-level theology students that stayed in the chapel under the effects of psilocybin continued their religious observations with extraordinary results. One participant in particular, Houston Smith, who would go on to author several textbooks on comparative religion, described his experience as, quote, the most powerful cosmic homecoming I have ever experienced. The participants' use of pharmaceutical psilocybin, administered with the explicit purpose of inducing a mystical experience, in a church with a community of like-minded individuals is a beautiful example of well-executed dose, set, and setting, which I just brought up. The participants were administered a very safe and manageable dose with the intention of eliciting a mystical experience all the while in a church reading scriptures, singing hymns, and again, surrounded by like-minded and supportive colleagues. In his 25-year follow-up study to the Good Friday Experiment, Rick Doblin said that Pank's study cast, quote, a considerable doubt on the assertion that mystical experiences catalyzed by drugs are in any way inferior to non-drug mystical experiences in both their immediate content and long-term effects. The Good Friday Experiment was again replicated under more controlled conditions in 2002 by John Hopkins Medical, led by clinical psychiatrist Roland Griffiths, and virtually the same results ensued as the 1962 Miracle at Marsh Chapel. Long-term meditators and religious practitioners regularly report the serious difference between endogenously and exogenously elicited religious ecstasy, specifically the comparison between prayer and meditation to the effects brought on by clinically administered psilocybin. That is to say, individuals who had previously reported an endogenous or on-the-natch experience uh, then went on to report properly administered psilocybin to be utterly incomparable in terms of the profundity or ineffable psychological, visionary, or spiritual properties that the experience brought on. Walter Pink designed his Marsh Chapel study under the now infamous Dr. Timothy Leary, who was at the time head of the Harvard Psilocybin Project. Leary and his fellow cohorts in the Harvard Psilocybin Project conducted similar experiments with psychedelics for over two years, beginning in 1960, until the studies were put to an end by other professors in the Harvard Center for Research and Personality due to safety and ethical concerns. Despite being shut down after such a short period, the Harvard Psilocybin Project helped collect an impressive body of uh, evidence supporting the hypothesis that these chemicals had the ability to clinically produce a mystical experience. Quote, 
We have arranged transcendent experiences for over 1,000 persons from all walks of life, including 69 full-time religious professionals, about half of whom profess the Christian or Jewish faith and about half of whom belong to Eastern religions. Included in this roster are two college deans, a divinity college president, three university chaplains, an executive of a religious foundation, a prominent religious editor, and several distinguished religious philosophers. At this point, it is conservative to state that over 75% of these subjects report intense mystico-religious responses, and considerably more than half had the deepest spiritual experience of their life. The imperative synergy of dose, set, and setting cannot be overstated here. As we will see in just a moment, although our ancestors did not use these words, dose, set, and setting, they still appreciated them as conceptual variables that had to be considered. The philosophical and religious mecca of the ancient Greek world was undoubtedly the Eleusinian Mysteries. The Mysteries were an annually held series of initiation ceremonies for the cult of Demeter and Persephone based at the plains of Eleusis. Starting in approximately 1500 BCE, the Eleusinian Mysteries reliably administered an experience of visionary gnosis to the masses for nearly two millennia. This ceremony was available to all classes of society, and nearly every major mover and shaker of the ancient Greek world attended. Initiates could attend the ceremony once in a lifetime and were sworn to secrecy thereafter. Despite this widespread secrecy, there are extant plays and writings which cleverly hint at what exactly took place at Eleusis. Plutarch uh, described the events as such when he's speaking of death. The soul suffers an experience similar to those who celebrate the great initiations. He's speaking of the Eleusinian mysteries. Wanderings astray in the beginning, tiresome walking in circles, some frightening paths in darkness that lead nowhere. Then, immediately before the end, all the terrible things, panic and shivering and sweat and amazement. And then some wonderful light comes in to greet you. And then some wonderful light comes in to greet you. Pure regions and meadows are there to greet you with sounds and dances and solemn sacred words and holy views. And there the initiate, perfect by now, set free and loose from all bondage, walks about crowned in a wreath, celebrating the festival together with the other sacred and pure people. And he looks down on the uninitiated, unpurified crowd in this world in mud and fog beneath his feet. The fact that participants of the mysteries would drink from a sacred vessel before such ecstatic and visionary experiences cannot be ignored. It is now a well-established theory that this drink, the kaikion, contains some kind of hallucinogenic elixir, the main contenders being an ergotized beer, ergot being the natural fungal source of its safer and far more reliable hallucinogenic derivative, LSD, or less plausibly a mushroom extraction of some kind, most likely from a psilocybe variety. These competing hypotheses come from various scholars' analysis of the Hymn to Demeter, which contains a recipe for what was in the Kaikion. Regardless which theory is correct, the effects are similar. Psilocybin produces psychoptic effects in human beings at doses ranging from 5 to 50 milligrams. Following oral ingestion, the onset of inebriation is much more rapid than with mescaline or with LSD, the major effects usually commencing within about 30 minutes. The inebriation lasts from three to six hours, depending on dose, and despite these differences in pharmacodynamics, the peak effects of psilocybin are remarkably similar to the peak effects of mescaline and LSD. AB psychotherapist S.M. Younger commented, quote, it is now rather commonly adjudged that the subjective effects of mescaline, LSD-25, and psilocybin are equivalent, similar, or indistinguishable. To quickly reiterate, The Eleusinian Mysteries were centered around an extremely sacred religious site to the ancient Greeks. It incorporated entheogenic substances in conjunction with a mass vision of the afterlife, which forever changed the initiates in a deep and powerful way. Finally, and most importantly, I think, the mindset or intention of the ancient Greek was honed to a razor's edge over a period of six months in preparation for this ceremony. The perfectly executed and adhered to application of dose, set, and setting at Eleusis is what led to its uninterrupted and unambiguous reputation of mystical reliability, which lasted nearly two millennia. Michael Quinn, author of The Early Mormonism and the Magical Worldview, convincingly puts forward that the parallels found in the Mormon temple ceremonies and secret rites of masonry were not due to the Mormons necessarily co-opting Masonic ceremonies, 
but that both groups were seeking an archaic revival of sorts of the Eleusinian mysteries, and that any similarities are coincidental in nature. If Quinn is correct in his assessment, and I think he is, then this certainly helps support the idea that the early church was using entheogenic substances in the sacrament and anointing ceremonies. Eleusis, however, is not the only place to look for entheogenic influences that this archaic revival had on the early Mormon church. Prior to the 20th century, the lines between the physical sciences, occultism, and mysticism were ill-defined and often blurry, varying greatly on ge with geography, uh, religious, and political climates. The synergistic culmination of these schools of learning was arguably most pronounced during the 16th and 17th century in Prague and what would later become Germany, with alchemists such as Paracelsus, Michael Meyer, von Helmont, and the like. Secretive cult-like societies like the Freemasons, Rosicrucians, and certain Anabaptist factions excuse me, began to organize and grow in membership. Their knowledge and esoteric understandings of alchemically derived plant medicines was brought to the New World with some of the first German immigrants. It is rather apparent through extant descriptions of these groups' rites and ceremonies that while not all, at least some of them, were employing entheogenic uh, compounds as sacrament. One group in particular has been taken note of by Mormon historians such as Lance Owens, Michael Quinn, and Dan Vogel. In 1720, the German mystic and pietist Johann Conrad Beisel immigrated to Pennsylvania seeking to join a group of German pietists. He subsequently associated himself with the few remaining mystics and later organized a Rosicrucian society, the Ephrata Cloister, near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Conrad Beisel commissioned a temple that was to be dedicated to the group's patriarchal elite known as the Brotherhood of Zion. Michael Quinn has already discussed the stark parallels between the early Mormon temple ceremony and garments to those of the esoteric temple rites performed by the Brotherhood of Zion at Ephrata. What has so far been overlooked by Mormon historians is that the temple rites of the Brotherhood of Zion clearly incorporated entheogenic substances. For a period of 40 days, initiates fasted and prayed, ingested a variety of currently unidentified alchemical substances, including the prima materia, grand elixir, or balsam, which, was then, in, which then induced a classic shamanic death and ego dissolution, as described by Marseille Eliade. The initiates were said to enter deep periods of sleep, punctuated by spiritual and physical rejuvenation and rebirth at the administration of angelic beings. Although we do not know the exact recipe for this mysterious alchemical substance used by the Ephrodans, we once again see unambiguous evidence of religiously administered psychoactives at play. The fact that initiates ingested obviously intoxicating substances on a daily basis, dosage, with the explicit intention of initiating theophany, set, inside a temple complex designed for that distinct ceremony, setting, can no longer be overlooked. Just as the mystery schools at Eleusis, the cult and Ephrata were designing and dialing in tightly controlled entheogenic rituals and religious rites. The cult of Ephrata was located just four miles from the Whitmer family, who themselves were German immigrants, and a majority of the original witnesses to Joseph's Golden Bible. Michael Quinn, in particular, has again put forward a convincing argument that at least some of the early Mormon ceremonies, and particularly those practiced in the temple, were directly influenced by the rites at Ephrata. If this is indeed the case, then it stands to reason that the employment of entheogens would have likewise been transferred to the early Mormons. I do not wish to give the impression that Joseph Smith was influenced, however, by just this one group or family. As my partner Bryce will go into in just a moment, young Joe was virtually surrounded by mystically inclined mentors and practitioners of alchemical substances. The influence of hermeticism, magic, and alchemy on the early Mormon worldview has already been well established at this point. However, what has again been so far overlooked by most Mormon historians is that these same source books of magic and hermeticism connected to the Smith family and the rise of Mormonism also contain recipes and instructions for the administration of psychoactive substances in entheogenic ceremonies. Just as there are a thousand ways to skin a cat, there are a myriad of ways to employ entheogens into religious ceremonies. If we just take a step back and analyze them as a whole, the birth of the Mormon church begins to come into better focus. All right, thank you very much, Cody. That was uh, very informative. So we gotta break it up for just a second. Do you guys want to play a game real quick? Yeah.
<laughs> all right, all right. So what we're going to do, we have a multiple choice here. we got a big group, so we're going to have everybody clap once for whatever they think the answer is. All right, does that sound good? Make sense? Okay, first question. If you guys think that homeopathy and root medicines are bad nowadays, imagine a world where Google didn't exist and you can fact check people, okay? What kind of medicine was this? It included skunk cabbage, whorehound, wake robin, bayberry bark, bitter root, nerve powder, and all of those things mixed together in molasses. Who thinks that that was a pain reliever? One clap. Nobody. Oh, okay. All right. Who thinks that this was a smallpox cure? Okay. Who thinks this was a sleep aid? Okay. More on that. Who thinks this was a cough syrup? About half split between sleep aid and cough syrup? Uh, it's a cough syrup. The molasses gave it away. All right, all right, all right. We, we got the idea. Okay, next one. Which of these ailments were not, emphasis on not, cured by this nerve ointment? And it included bark of the root of bittersweet, wormwood, chamomile, and turpentine. Because why not? All right. Was this not a cure for hmm? bruises? Okay. Who thinks this wasn't a cure for rheumatism? Who thinks this wasn't a cure for sprains? And who thinks it wasn't a cure for corns? All right, that was the last one. It was This is kind of a hard one. This is actually not a cure for rheumatism. Yeah, all right. So how about the next one? In order to treat eye infections, they had eye drops, what is the missing ingredient in this recipe? This recipe has garlic, onion. You're putting this in your eyes, okay? Leeks and honey. What is the missing ingredient? We have Eye of Newt. Anybody? Any takers? No? Uh, oh, a couple? All right. All right. Crushed mustard seed. Okay. Okay. Who thinks that it was filet of fenny snake? I don't know what a fenny snake is. Whatever. All right. And who thinks that the last ingredient was freshly killed cow's bile? That one won out. Uh, you guys got that one. <laughs> it's D. And it's freshly killed. Okay, all right. This is the last one. Okay. What was the colloquial term for the anesthetic made from these ingredients? It included boar's bile, wild lettuce, opium, henbane, bryony, mandrake root, hemlock, vinegar, and wine. What's the colloquial term for this? Is it peaceful home? It fits, right? Okay. Who thinks it was Hawthorne Moon? Okay. Who thinks it was called Dwale? Who thinks this was called Ludes? <laughs> Who thinks it's the Cosby special? <laughs> Correct answer, Dwale. I don't know what that word is, but no. It, there's an anachronism in here. Can anybody spot it? Okay, all right. That's our game. We're all winners at Sunstone. Good job, everybody. All right, let's get back into it. We have the Joseph Smith Magic Worldview. Joseph Smith was born into a world where magic ruled, and science as we know it was but one small aspect of some spiritual pursuits such as alchemy and masonry. Many scientists that we champion today as making post-enlightenment breakthroughs were just as deeply engaged in things we consider, consider scientifically laughable today, like astrology and numerology. In order to understand Joseph Smith and his worldview, it's necessary for us to suspend our modernistic understandings and grant the magic worldview without prejudice. This, the world of Joseph Smith moved and was subsequently manipulated by the magic forces seen throughout nature. The entheogens that we're discussing weren't seen as psychoactive plant medicines with very specific neurochemical manifestations. Instead, for Joseph Smith... The spirit of God lived inside these magic entheogens, and partaking of them in a conducive set and setting with the proper dosage was how he could connect with God, or speak with the divine, if you will. Joseph was a student of celebrities in the occult magic world. Paracelsus, Agrippa, John D., Francis Barrett, Ebenezer Sibley, all of these people moved in a world heavily steeped and manipulated by magic occultism. John, uh, D. Michael Quinn and other Mormon historians have connected Joseph Smith and the magic worldview with these individuals, but they've seemingly overlooked the entheogenic influences in their writings. 
Now we go on to the early influence of Joseph Smith, and obviously his parents are some of the greatest candidates. Included in Lucy Mack Smith's biography of 1853, she included seven visions from Joseph Smith Sr. She described five of them, and this is one of them, and it seems to perfectly describe what we know as a detour tree. So any slides that have quotes on them, don't get ahead of me. I'm going to read the quotes, but just, just listen to me, and then I'll read the quotes later. Okay, quote, I was traveling in an open and desolate field, which appeared to be very barren. I beheld a beautiful stream of water, which ran from the east to the west. I could see a rope, not an iron rod, running along the bank of it, about as high as a man could reach, and beyond me was a low but very pleasant valley in which stood a tree. Does this sound familiar? It was exceedingly handsome, and he goes about describing this tree, insomuch that I looked upon it with wonder and admiration. And this is the part to pay attention to. Its beautiful branches spread themselves somewhat like an umbrella, and it bore a kind of fruit in the shape much like a chestnut burr, and as white as snow, or if possible, whiter. I gazed upon the same with considerable interest, and as I was doing so, the burrs or shells commenced opening and shedding their particles or the fruit which they contained, which was of dazzling whiteness. This is the important part. I drew near and began to eat of it. And it found it delicious beyond description. I presently turned to my guide and inquired of him the meaning of the fruit that was so delicious. He told me it was the pure love of God, shed abroad in the hearts of all those who love and keep his commandments. Any time that somebody's describing a vision quest... Maybe we should focus on the plant itself instead of the person or the state of mind that they were in, because that sounds like a perfect description of what is known, and in the pictures, as a datura plant. Many people know this as jimson weed. It's just a weed that grows around everywhere, but it's incredibly psychoactive. We move from the early... Mormonism or early Joseph Smith influence into early Mormonism. We're kind of ripping through this. There's a transitions in the paper. Read the paper. We have to rip through it. But Parley P. Pratt describes the, the early church doctrine in Kirland, Ohio. And one of the earliest aspects of church doctrine which survived from the earliest days was sacrament. Now, if we talk about the endowment ceremony, baptisms for the dead, polygamy, the Melchizedek priesthood, the word of wisdom, all of those things came years after the church was organized in 1830, but the sacrament has always been there. Even the missionaries were proselyting with the help of the sacrament, which Parley P. Pratt was happy to tell us about during the early Kirtland years. I'm going to get to it in a second. This quote we're about to read describes many interesting and odd scenes which are very hard to explain without some kind of dosage being a part of the equation. And it should be noted that many of the described scenarios happened without the presence of the prophet before he got to Kurland. Uh, these are descriptions of what some of the congregations were experiencing during the sacrament ritual. Quote, As I went forth among the different branches, some very strange spiritual operations were manifested, which were disgusting rather than edifying. Some persons would seem to swoon away and make unseemly gestures and be drawn or disfigured in their countenances. Others would fall into ecstasies and be drawn into contortions and cramps and fits, etc. Others would seem to have visions and revelations which were not edifying, which were not congenial to the doctrine and spirit of the gospel. In short, a false and lying spirit seemed to be creeping into the church. Feeling our weakness and inexperience, weakness and inexperience in what? Um, at last, and, and lest we should err in judgment concerning these spiritual phenomena, myself, John Murdoch, and several other elders went to Joseph Smith and asked him to inquire of the Lord concerning these spiritual manifestations, and subsequently a revelation was delivered. Moving on to further into early Mormonism into the Kirtland years, because Kirtland is where we see this hotbed of possible entheogen use happening. This is a quote, uh, this is taken from Richard Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling, um, a fairly trusted Mormon historian. And this is a quote uh, synthesized from a few different accounts. Quote, the elders met in a log schoolhouse near Isaac Morley's farm, hoping for a spiritual endowment. Levi Hancock, who had earlier been startled by visionaries, was baffled by what had happened that day. Joseph promised Lyman White he would see Christ that day. Okay, we have Joseph programming somebody's mindset before they partake of the sacrament. White soon turned stiff and white exclaiming that he had indeed viewed the Savior. According to Hancock, Joseph himself now said, I now see God and Jesus is at his right hand. It's worth noting, taking a brief pause, when somebody's in a highly suggestible state that might be catalyzed by entheogens, um, when somebody that's guiding that, a spiritual leader is guiding that experience, and they say, I see God walking through the congregation, the other people may 
indeed see that same thing or they may reflect on the experience and think that they saw that happen as well. So it's this suggestible state of mind and Joseph was their spiritual leader. It continues. Then the meeting unraveled. This is where it gets exciting. Joseph ordained Harvey Whitlock to the high priesthood, the most important business of the meeting, and Whitlock reacted badly. Now, ordaining back then wasn't just blessing laying out of hands. It also included anointing oil, which may have been a vehicle for entheogens. He, he turned as black as Lyman was, light, was white. Hancock reported his fingers were set like claws, and he went around the room and showed his hands and tried to speak. His eyes were the shape of O's. <laughs> Astonished at the turn of events, Hiram exclaimed, Joseph, this is not of God. Joseph, unwilling to cut the phenomenon short, told Hiram to wait. But Hiram insisted, I will not believe unless you inquire of God and he owns it. Hancock said, Joseph bowed his head and in a short time got up and commanded Satan to leave Harvey, laying his hands upon him at the same time. So it required exorcism. To, to ground him or something. Then Hancock said, Lehman Copley, who weighed over 200 pounds, somersaulted in the air and fell on his back over a bench. White cast Satan out of Copley, and Copley was calmed. This was not the spiritual endowment the elders had expected. <laughs> and the outburst may have contributed to the trouble and unbelief among the disciples. End quote. What is it that Hiram said, this is not of God? <laughs> Bad trip. Are we to believe that some supernatural force was working on them and causing this incredible phenomenon? Or is it more reasonable to assume that Joseph had just turned the dosage up a little bit too high and the elders were dealing with the onset symptoms of entheogen overdose, you know, thus scaring Hiram and the participants? Once again, it shows us that this worldview for these folks included entheogens as being a conduit to God. And the trip turning good or bad was based on set and setting, but they perceived these things as the endowment or the wrath of God. Now we come to Joseph's magnum opus, the Kirtland Temple Dedication Ceremony. It had been revealed to Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon that in, during one of their many meetings, safety meetings as we might call them, that a house of worship should be made. And four years later, a four-year-long project, the Kirtland Temple was completed, set to be dedicated in March of 1836. If we incorporate the Smith Entheogen historical model into what happened at the dedication ceremony, we can reasonably postulate that Smith had spent years cultivating and practicing the perfect dosage, set, and setting so that he could reliably incite theophany in those who partook of the sacrament. And both in his early years prior to Mormonism, as well as once he founded the, the Mormon religion. Now we get to the Kirtland Temple dedication ceremony. There's a lot of text on that slide. Don't worry about reading it because I'm going to read it. Quote, this is from Joseph Smith. Quote, Brother George A. Smith arose and began to prophesy when a noise was heard like the sound of a rushing mighty wind. That's well documented as an effect of entheogens, uh, hearing auditory hallucinations, which filled the temple and the, all the congregation simultaneously arose, being moved upon by an invisible power. Many began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Others saw glorious visions, and I beheld the temple was filled with angels." Which fact I declared to the congregation. The people of the neighborhood came running together, hearing an unusual sound within and seeing a bright light like a pillar of fire resting upon the temple, and were astonished at what was taking place. Now here's a quote from Heber C. Kimball, another trusted individual in Mormon history. Quote, During the ceremonies of the dedication, an angel appeared and sat near President Joseph Smith Sr. and Frederick Dree Williams so that they had a fair view of his person. He was a very tall person, black eyes, white hair, and stoop-shouldered. His garment was whole, extending to his ankles, and his feet he had on sandals. He was sent as a messenger to accept of the dedication. While these things were being attended to, the beloved disciple John was seen in our midst by the prophet Joseph, Oliver Cowdery, and others. End quote. So this person walking through the congregation, it might have been just a guy with an overcoat on, but Joseph was saying, I see the angels, I see John the Beloved in front of us, and everybody reflected on it or said at the time, I see it too. Another quote from Milo Andrews, and this is really important because this illustrates perfect dosage set and setting. Quote, Milo Andrews, a faithful 70 who had been a member of the Ilstard Zions camp, despaired of seeing 
the celestial visitors until Joseph told him to continue to fast and pray. So he couldn't see the angels, and Joseph said, hey, continue to fast and pray, and you're going to get there. So Joseph was programming the set, his mindset. When we had fasted for 24 hours, marveled Milo, and partaken of the Lord's Supper, there's the dosage, namely a piece of bread as big as your double fist and half a pint of wine. That's not very much alcohol, but if it's on an empty stomach, yes, but that's still not very much alcohol. But if there's something dosed in it, mm, that, that half a pint of wine can be really powerful. Now, it says, uh, I was there and saw the Holy Ghost descend upon the heads of those present like cloven tongues of fire. I said, it is enough, Father, and I will bear faithful testimony of it while I live. Joseph programmed the perfect dosage set and setting. Now, these are merely three of dozens of accounts describing the dedication ceremony. There are many similar themes running through these accounts. Many of them describe a quickening of the spirit, a whooshing noise, uh, bright lights filling the whole temple. Some people thought the temple was on fire. Uh, and much rarer, but still present, some people actually hallucinated angels or God walking through in corporeal form through the congregation. Smith had programmed the perfect dosage set and setting, and the majority of the people in, the, in, uh, in attendance had the dosage of the wine, and they had the, that was the perfect added variable to incite theophany in these people. Now we move beyond Curland. Does anybody know who that's a picture of? John, uh, John Bennett. Everybody said it. Okay, all right. John Bennett was a strong advocate of the temperance movement. He was a teetotaler, and he enshrined this in early Mor or in Mormonism during the Nauvoo years. So they ended up passing a temperance bill in Nauvoo during John, uh, John Bennett's brief time with Joseph Smith. And this is what Joseph said in response to public outrage about this temperance bill being passed. Quote, in the discussion of the foregoing temperance bill, I spoke at great length on the use of liquors and showed that it was unnecessary and operates as a poison in the stomach. So he's saying, you guys, alcohol is bad for you. And that roots and herbs can be found to affect all necessary purposes. End quote. People were mad that they were getting rid of the alcohol, and Joseph's like, nah, don't worry about it. We got roots and herbs and anything you want to happen, we're, we got you covered. The fact that Joseph Smith said that roots and herbs can be used in, instead of alcohol, it just shows us that he was familiar with these plants. And he knew that they could cause the same intoxicating effects. And we surmise that those plants and roots were, indeed, entheogens. Now we have what we call, not necessarily the smoking gun, but the bullet hole. And we think this is some... some unequivocal evidence that there may have been something special about this wine. The first account we're going to read is from William E. McClellan, and it's, it's important to read, but the second account is more important. Quote, as to the endowment in Kirtland, the dedication ceremony, I state positively that it was no endowment from God. Not only myself was not endowed, but no other man of the 500 who was present, except it was with wine. Now, William McClellan, granted, is a bit of a polarizing individual in church history, but I think it does us a disservice to claim that he didn't know the difference between alcohol and alcohol that was infused with entheogens. People were frequently drinking alcohol, often as a safe measure or safe way to, to be hydrated, because water was really bad for you back then. So, William McClellan said, yeah, the endowment, it was just a wine. I think that's, I think the way Cody said it is, that was his way of saying if a tree falls and nobody's around to hear it, does it still make a sound? If somebody walked in and they weren't part of – if they weren't dosed and they just walked in, would they actually see angels in the rafters or would they just see a bunch of drunk people? Now, the second quote is much more important and this describes the happenings on the Isaac Morley farm when Joseph was honing in the dosage set and setting prior to the dedication ceremony. Quote, I attended their meeting. I believe I was the first person with a young man whose name I have forgotten – who was present when they took what was called the sacrament up at the Morley house. They were in the habit of turning everybody out the door when they partook of the bread and wine. They didn't want to share, apparently. Putting up blankets at the windows, shutting off the sight from without. They started a regular powwow. And when they got well going, they opened the door and let us come in. A young man and myself made it up that we would stay in unless they took us out by force. So, Jasper Jesse Moss... It should be noted, he's a trained physician. He went into this with a skeptical mind. He didn't have the right mindset, the wrong set for it to incite theophany. And he wanted to see what was going on in these, these meetings. Now, that he describes the meetings, and this is really important. 
the young man got asleep, and I had the dumb evil and could not talk. So he probably felt some kind of dosage. But they did not carry us out, but went on with the sacrament. And this is great. The poor house in Portage County, Ohio, where there were half a dozen insane and idiotic persons, was the best comparison of anything to the scene that night. If I had my cloak on, I would have stolen the wine and carried it home to see whether it was drugged or not. That's from 1831. This guy was accusing the saints of drugging people through the wine. And he was a trained physician. <laughs> I, I mean, it's I, I, he approached it with a skeptical mind, and he he had the dumb evil. This is just a very powerful account. That's why we say it's not the smoking gun documentary evidence, but this is the bullet hole we're looking for. Now, if Joseph Smith used these things, we can't just say that his mom and dad taught him how to use it. We need a mentor. We need somebody who knew how to manipulate plant medicines and roots and herbs in order to have taught Joseph Smith the use of these things. That outside influence is Lumen Walters. And he taught Joseph, he likely taught Joseph Smith all that Smith needed to know in order to safely manipulate these things. This is a quote from Brigham Young talking about Lumen Walters. Quote, Joseph was what we call an ignorant boy, but this fortune teller, whose name I do not remember, was a man of profound learning. He put himself in possession of all of the learning in the States, had been to France, Germany, Italy, and through the world. Quick pause. Europe was a hotbed of entheogen experimentation. If you wanted to learn about occultism, hermeticism, alchemy, you went to Europe and you brought the knowledge over with you. Um, continuing on. He had been educated for a priest and turned out to be a devil. I do not know, but that he would have been a devil if he had followed the profession of a priest among what are termed the Christian denominations. He could preach as, as well as the best of them, and I never heard a man swear as he did. He could tell those plates were there. Lumen Walters was a treasure digger with Joseph Smith. And that they were a treasure whose value the, po the people could not, or <laughs> to the people could not be told for that I myself heard him say. Now, this is a quote from the obituary, from one of the obituaries from Lumen Walter's death. And at the time, uh, I'll talk about it in a second. Quote, we have often heard it remarked, the fools are not all dead yet, in reference to Lumen Walters. We are convinced of the fact by a letter which has been placed in our hands, of which the following is a verbatim copy. Dr. Walters, to whom it is addressed, has some reputation as a physician skilled in the curative properties of roots and yarbs and brandy. But he brings to his aid a conjuration stone. A seer stone. As believed by this Vermont doctor surpasses the credulity of Dr. Walter's neighbors. So Lumen Walters had a sordid past with the Smith family treasure digging group. Read the book of Pukii to get all of the insight on that. Um, but before, uh, after his time with uh, early Mormonism in Kirtland, he moved up to a town called Gorham, New York, and built up a successful medicine business. And he was known for his remarkable ability and his eccentric ability as a physician who used these roots and herbs delivered through brandy and probably other alcohols. But this is the thing. Practitioners of mesmerism, occultism, scrying, and all of the magic rituals, they lived in a tight-knit world of study, and in, they were incestuously passing around publications and books among their small groups of fellow magicians and occultists. The treasure digging group with which the Smiths were affiliated was one of these groups. One member would get a hold of a, an occult book or a periodical, and it wasn't long before everybody in the treasure digging group knew the knowledge in that periodical, whether it was through osmosis of conversation or reading it themselves. Joseph Smith absorbed this knowledge. Samuel Lawrence, Joseph Knight Sr., Josiah Stowell, the Chase brothers, all of these people were members of or affiliated with the Joseph Smith Treasure Digging Group. And on a regular basis, they were exchanging valuable knowledge, and they were neighbors and friends. So now we get to where this actually holds predictive power. Any historical theory for this historical Smith entheogen theory to be historically tenable, it needs to have predictive power. If Smith learned the manipulation and storage of these entheogens, it was from Lumen Walters. So we would need to prove that Walters had the necessary knowledge and the materials to pass that on to Joseph Smith. Now, ideally, it would be great 
to find one of Walter's old medical books with his own notes and annotations in the side notes, but that seems incredibly unlikely. He didn't have very many of them um, in his inventory list, so we probably won't find any of these. So that would be great, but we got to the next best thing. So we went to the uh, Ontario County Records and Archives Department in Canandaigua, New York, and looked up the microfilm of his probate record, which had an inventory list. And in this inventory list, it was it was like four or five pages worth of inventory. We pulled a couple of line items out that were, we thought, fascinating to say the least. We have one cider barrel, which often cider was alcoholic cider, one pounding barrel, a 50th of Columbo root, 10 bottles of liquid medicine, a lot of dry medicine. Now, granted, this is after his death, so he had probably liquidated most of the stock before he retired and died. And then we also have 15 yards of carpet, about 40 loads of manure valued at $25.50, and then five to seven total medical books. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a shitload of manure. And you can lay carpet, <laughs> you can lay carpet on top of manure in order to cultivate mycelial colonies for psilocybin or medicinal mushrooms. So he has the things necessary in his inventory to cultivate and use these entheogens. And he was known as an eccentric doctor. This is our guy. Now we need to note, this is nothing new. Okay, Robert Beckstead in 2007 presented Restoration and the Sacred Mushroom here at Sunstone. And that laid the foundation, the blueprints for the Smith entheogen theory. And we talk about him quite a bit in our booklet and give him proper props because he really put a lot of due diligence into this. But before that, we have Lamar's Peterson's book from the 70s, uh, Hearts Made Glad. It deals with the charges of intemperance against Joseph Smith. But he stopped at alcohol alone. He didn't incorporate entheogens because, well, it's the 70s. It's very scandalous. But then we have Jasper Moss's account from a trained physician, and that was from uh, the account was recounted in 1887. But in 1831, that's when he had the thought that maybe they, there's something in this wine. But beyond that, anybody who reads these accounts from the Kirtland Temple dedication ceremony, from the Isaac Morley farm, from the John Johnson farm, from all of the school of the prophets, wherever the elders were meeting with Joseph Smith and partaking of the sacrament. You read about these visionary accounts, and it's really hard not to say, what were they on? Because I want some. <laughs> so with the exception of Lumen Walter's list, nothing that we're presenting here is new. It's just a culmination of many disparate pieces of evidence that we're bringing together and presenting in one palpable format. Now, we have to acknowledge limitations and alternate theories, Okay. There's a lack of documentary evidence. We don't have the actual smoking gun. Like I said, there's bullet holes all over, but we don't have the smoking gun document where we see a line item from the Whitney uh, Company store that says Joseph Smith bought these mushrooms at this time, and then we see a spike in the visionary accounts. We don't have that document. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but mm, it's really hard to, to see where we're, we're hoping. You know, Fingers crossed. We can see. Now, there's evidential unfamiliarity. The only way that we're able to cobble this together is Cody has an incredible amount of knowledge of entheogens and the history of those. I have a, a working knowledge of church history, and we're able to weave those paths of knowledge together. But oftentimes, those schools of thought stay completely separate. So people in the two fields don't talk very much. So this probably just hasn't been thought of is kind of the problem. Now, there's so people in both fields are just unfamiliar with the evidence of the opposing fields. Now, we have to acknowledge there's a certain amount of confirmation bias, and every good scientist and historian has to acknowledge that they have confirmation bias. But once we begin to view the Joseph Smith theory, um, the Smith antigen theory, it's really hard to not see pieces of evidence and say, oh, well, this sounds like they were on drugs. So confirmation bias doesn't nullify a theory we just have to acknowledge that it exists and try to check it at every point that we possibly can to get close, as close to reality as we po can possibly get. And now the alternate theory is often described as Pentecostal revivalism. But the visions and experiences reported by the early saints, those uh, Pentecostal revivals still exist today, and people talk about this. It's often couched as, well, my grandma saw angels. Was she hopped up on drugs? It's like, well, maybe, but I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but that's the thing is this presentation is just as much about entheogens as it is altered states of consciousness. People can get into an altered state of consciousness through the things that Cody talked about, through dancing, through ecstatic yoga, through uh, holotropic breathing methods, through all of these incredible methods. It just so happens that entheogens are reliable. 
and you know that the majority of people who, when they take the proper dosage, bam, they're going to get hit with it. And they're going to get, if they're in the proper set and setting, they're going to get into this religious and spiritual magnificent experience. And the accounts of Pentecostal revivalism, after people go home from church, nothing happens. But the saints oftentimes were staying, or there were a few accounts of saints being in swoonings for a couple days at a time. That doesn't happen with Pentecostal revivalism. So this is our conclusion, and we're gonna, we have a tiny bit of time for Q&A. Basically, we can't truly understand Smith's mindset, but we can get closer to it by reading the same material he consumed and studying the magic world view. People accused Joseph Smith of drugging people, and given the circumstances, that seems a completely rational conclusion to postulate. Now, without appealing to highly conjectural uh, group hallucinations, the Smith entheogen theory posits a naturalistic explanation for the available evidence, and that's what we're, it, we're, we're interested in. Historians don't have access to the divine. They have to posit naturalistic models. And now, given humans' history with entheogens, they are remarkable plant medicines, and this is our main point. They require further study and research, as well as a paradigm shift in public perceptions. Despite its longevity and explanatory power, the Smith entheogen historical model comparatively lacks hard documentary evidence and therefore requires a multidisciplinary approach to history to unravel. But it's no surprise the Smith entheogen model of Mormon history has gone largely uninvestigated and unexplored for the last century. New documentary evidence must be gathered before this historical model reaches the level of academic theory or academic falsifiability. An even greater obstacle? Much more research is necessary before the mainstream LDS church embraces the Smith entheogen theory. Thank you. I think we have six minutes for Q&A. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, is there a microphone for people to walk up to? Uh, there's not a microphone, so I guess just shout it out and I'll try and repeat it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, use one of those microphones over there so we can get it on record. Orson Pratt lamented that he didn't. Uh, he was out of town when all of the other apostles, etc., had the visitations with Christ and everything, as I remember. Oh, wow. And okay. while he's a very scientific-based person, probably maybe one of the smartest people in the church ever as far as science and if not, he had the best beard of any woman ever. <laughs> I don't know. When he got back into town, he lamented that he never had the same visions that everyone else had. Why do you suppose that – do you think the fact that he had that scientific bent, which of the different uh, – the place, the, the setting, the time – why didn't Orson Pratt have the same kind of visions that everyone else got to have? Uh, much in the same way that Jasper, uh, Jasper Jesse Moss didn't have the experience uh, at the Isaac Morley farm simply because he went in with a heavy dose of skepticism. Uh, I would say that his set, his mindset or intention going in may not have been dialed in. Again, this is not 100% reliable. We're looking at, you go from Pentecostal revivalism or hypnosis, which can elicit visions in maybe 10 to 20% of participants, versus entheogens where you're getting to 90 to 95%. There's still Still a margin of error, but the statistical reliability is just, it's stark. Um, so that would, that would be my response. I just had a question about where you guys ultimately come down on the, the nature of these mystical experiences, because one thing I was having a hard time parsing in the presentation was you use terms like entheogen, theophany, and then the word like hallucination, which sort of implies not real. Um, you showed the William James quote where he's kind of agnostic about what these experiences are. I'm sure you've read somebody like Rick Strassman who's also agnostic about are these things really there, really there in quotes. So where do you fall on that? Uh, this is where the, the conversation gets a little problematic, and uh, you know we only have an hour to go over a lot of this. Um, but essentially, uh, many neuroscientists would would argue that your entire perception of reality is a hallucination. Um, everything that you perceive is, in turn, some kind of hallucination, and these substances are merely affecting the filtering mechanism in your brain, which limits how much you're hallucinating. So. Uh, there's a, it's a little nuance to go into here, but uh, if you'd like to catch me outside, I'd love to talk more with you about this. 
Uh, I'd just like to point out that hermetic traditions, going back to the ancient world, some of which you touched on, always assumed that the journey to achieving gnosis, spirituality, involves a series of steps, meditation, intense prayer, isolation, and very well, possibly, uh, substances. We look at this as strange today, but, but this was the history. And actually, this uh, uh, presentation and, and Smith's use of these things, if it may have been, is not at all um, incompatible with understanding Smith as a hermetic uh, and uh, someone linked very much to the traditions of ancient Egypt and the ancient world. I think that just uh, – I'll just comment on that. I think that just gets further into uh, trying to encapsulate the entire magic worldview, and these things were um, obviously one small aspect of that. And if we grant the magic worldview, then we should probably grant the entheogen use as well. Can you explain maybe briefly the preparation process in order to get – these substances into a sacramental wine, how much would be required? I'm just trying to wrap my head around well, this is a if perfect... he's carrying around bags of this stuff and he's sneaking it in on the side, or if there's an actual process, maybe someone witnessed it. I mean, that those are, as a scientist, that's mm -hmm. interesting to find well, that's out. Well, that's a perfect transition. The stuff I have over here actually is a, as a demonstration of that. Um, most extractions are taking place in water, oil, or alcohol. And it takes, if you were to imagine those Jolly Ranchers as little nuggets of opium, you could see how quickly it would be dissolved into the, into the alcohol. Likewise, uh, the garlic and rosemary infuses itself into the oil in a matter of minutes. And uh, likewise, the water will pick up the uh, uh, lemon oil. Um, if you were to take normal bottles of sacramental wine and, say, the tincture that we keep mentioning uh, from, that uh, Lumen Walters was renowned for making, you could very easily, one to two eyedroppers per bottle, and just, now you have a sacrament, nobody would know the difference. You don't have to necessarily be carrying around tons of roots and herbs. You can essentially walk around with a, with a bottle like this and just eyedropper uh, things. It is, just to illustrate, I could make plant medicines that would put you into a comatose visionary state for days with what I could fit on the head of a pin. <laughs> So, how long acting are, um, sorry, when would the onset of one of the transdermal applications be? Because I've heard it's pretty slow acting. Stuff it's like that is generally pretty slow acting, and that could be a good way of testing mm -hmm. if there's any, like, um, well, there's some evidence that the anointings, uh, the style of anointings have changed. In the, uh, in the early Mormon church, it, it seems that they were anointing over the whole head or maybe even parts of the body, which the more, the more coverage you get, the faster and harder it's going to hit you. Um, again, you can make very potent ones where just a dot on your forehead is more than enough to elicit this. But it would take uh, probably an hour or two of, uh, as opposed to maybe like 45 minutes or a half hour with ingestion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Last question. So, um, great uh, presentation today. One of the things that I'm curious about is, uh, assuming that Smith and the early Mormons did consume antheogens, or maybe even today people have experiences taking substances like this, in your opinion... Is there any connection between what people experience and maybe whether that antigen just simply unlocks new pathways in the brain? Uh, they call you know, scientists talk about neuroplasticity and how some of these antigens like create new pathways mm -hmm. and new lines of thought. Is it simply scientific? Is it simply just a makeup, in your opinion, of our genetics and, and what we would then like our own conscious and subconscious? Or in your opinion, do you believe in some sort of superconscious or a divine that can then communicate? to these people, and was there anything potentially outside of what their own brains were perceiving that was actually causing these experiences? Let's talk out in the okay. law. <laughs> that's, really that's a big topic. Um, again, it kind of goes into the idea that everything is a hallucination, um, and these chemicals simply mediate how much you're hallucinating or to what degree. Um, I'll be very quick um, <laughs> outside, sure. and we can do this outside if you want. Um,
Before we're done, two last things. Joseph Smith's going to leave us with a final quote. I can take my Bible and go into the woods and learn more in two hours than you can learn in church if you should go two years all the time. I don't doubt that claim. All right, that'll do it. Thanks for listening.